This is an insight clip from the Dr. Geo Prostate Podcast. In this short segment, Dr. Nima Agdam explains how androgen deprivation therapy works with radiation and when it truly benefits patients, highlighting a more personalized approach to prostate cancer care. For the full interview, episode 161, click at the end of this clip. Let's get into it. The addition of hormone therapy or ADT, androgen deprivation therapy, along with radiation, is the idea there is that the tumor becomes more sensitive to the radiation or is there a therapeutic value to the ADT by its individually by itself? Or combine is better because of that radio sensitivity? Yeah, I mean, I think that's some thought suggests that on the biological level, you're sensitizing the cancer to more deliberate effects of radiation. Uh, some people think that independently, it has an effect on micrometastatic disease. Some people think that it merely extends the length of time. You will not have a PSA rise for those who are going to fail by a period of time. And thus, it looks like it's improving. I, I am a believer that when ADT helps patients, it really helps patients. And I say when, because I think that refinement is taking place right in front of our eyes. And by that, I mean, yes, I think certain patients absolutely need hormone therapy. Do I think every patient in a category needs it? I think that we are learning that maybe not. Maybe there are signatures, whether you use an AI technology or whether you use a genomic signature to classify patients who would benefit from hormone therapy. We're learning that there are in fact quantitative and qualitative measures at the initial diagnosis that helps you decide whether someone could benefit from hormone therapy and uh, we're seeing that in play now very frequently in clinics we're ordering genomic classifiers we're ordering ai based testing and uh, we're making clinical decisions and that's the brave new world that we live in so it's important to be able to interpret that data utilize it in clinic and i believe that our patients will be the beneficiaries of that it's an life. Yeah. It, finally, the promise of personalized medicine might be manifesting into our everyday practice. That's right. The notion of being on ADT after while undergoing radiation or during that time period of 24 months, 18 to 24 months, where does that information come from? Here's why I ask. A lot of people come to me and they say, what should I do? Right. I'm, I'm sort of their quarterback, if you will. Yeah. If you know the football analogy there. And I oftentimes say, depending on a lot of factors that maybe we're not going to get into, but I oftentimes say, look, ask them why not a year, right? Tell them you're doing this, you're doing this lifestyle stuff, you're doing all these things. Assuming that your PSA is undetectable and things look good, imaging looks good, why not a year versus 18 months to 24 months so that now, you know, you could get your hormones back and feel good again? Yeah, yeah. And not only that, why not ask for particular agents? So. That's a very important point, because what you're really asking is why not give our patients lives back to them sooner if we can. Yeah. So as clinicians who are on this side, we desperately want to do one thing, and that is to prolong our patients' lives. And again, I'm like a broken record. I keep coming back to this. We've gotten so good at doing that with patients in prostate cancer world that our focus should now be very much very much on refining the length of time, even the necessity of hormone therapy in patients. Now, as I was describing to you earlier, these classifiers are being applied to large, large studies. And let me tell you, the way that we establish our guidelines is that we take thousands of patients, we give some of them a certain length of time, we give some of them a certain length of time, and we decide after five to 10 years, who does better? These clinical trials are thoughtful, they're well-designed, but they do lack refinement in that one cohort gets six months, the other cohort gets 18 months, the other cohort gets 24 months, the other cohort gets 36 months, and then we decide which one does better. And it may be that the 36 months has about 3% improvement, but that doesn't mean that everyone should get 36 months, right? You have to have a conversation with the patient. Are you willing to be castrated for an additional two years in favor of a couple percentage points higher survival. And I would ask, and I find that 
the answer is often no, outside of a few, you know, people who are clearly concerned about their overall survival over their quality of life. So in my view, this is where the biggest promise of personalized medicine, personalized testing, AI-based uh, classifiers becomes relevant because as early as recently as this year, we've seen that patients can be potentially selected to get six months instead of 18 months based on certain signatures that you see on their initial pathology, whether that's done through a digital image of the scan or whether it's on the genomics that's still being worked out. But I also know that there are certain types of radiation that would require fewer months of hormone therapy and they have much better outcomes. So for example, when you give patients dose intensified radiation and you deliver that radiation after maybe five weeks of radiation, you give additional radiation, whether it's in the form of brachytherapy seeds or in my view, in the form of um, SBRT boost, these patients tend not to require as long of a hormone therapy for whatever reason. And that reason is probably because you are getting a more advanced and more aggressive form of radiation. And maybe that's where we should focus on and improve that approach and sort of modulate the need for longer course of hormone therapy. But again, these studies yeah. have to be done rigorously and thoughtfully, but I think that it's a matter of time before we have to tell someone with high risk disease who ordinarily would require 18, 24, sometimes 36 months of hormone therapy, that they could simply be just as well with six months of hormone therapy. That'll be great. Now, the radiation, one, so the radiation benefits don't stop after those either five weeks of therapy or five days of yeah. therapy. It continues for how long after that? And the reason why that question is, so maybe if we know how long the radiation will be still working at way after the treatment, that's maybe that's the length of time that we that's want a, the ADT. That's a very system. elegant point, which, you know, you have to make to all the all of my colleagues who prescribe the medication. I think that, again, this would suggest that the sole purpose of hormonal therapy is to sensitize patients to radiation. And it is true. When you impact a cell, you impact its ability to procreate. And prostate cancer is notorious for not procreating rapidly. So you tend to have its impact more protracted. You also have these little mechanisms of subcellular damage to the cells that don't necessarily manifest until a while after treatment. And that time varies from weeks to months. And then you have the way that the body responds to radiation, right? So that's a critical part of it too. And this sort of diverges to a different idea where we know when we talk to patients that the side effects of radiation may manifest years later. So equally, it's possible that the impact of radiation is continuing on for several months after the treatment is finished. And one way of looking at hormone therapy, if it was exclusively meant to radiosensitize, is precisely to your point, to stop giving it to patients as soon as radiation has stopped working. A, I don't believe we have a quantifiable way to describe how long radiation continues to work after. And I'm not convinced that we know how long it would work in individual. But I find the idea very compelling. And I think that for a group of us who believe that hormone therapy is radio sensitizer, that's the way to do it. Because in cases of chemotherapy, we don't give giving chemotherapy if it was meant to be radio sensitizer long after it's done. We give that's a different right. dose, we give a different regimen, but we don't give a radio sensitizing agent after radiation is done. So to your point is elegant and one worthy of thinking about. And I suspect those patients who can get away with six months really needed that hormone therapy to help them with radiation. Right. So I'm glad that I've been in the ballpark with some of my recommendations because I have said six or 12 months, but then sometimes the radiation oncologist from anywhere in the country, they kind of bark at that. And but I don't have they don't have nor do I have seen good research as to why. Right? Yeah, I mean, it was clinical trials that were, again, done and, and as refined as you want the clinical trial to be, you also need a simple question to ask six versus 12 hasn't been asked, six versus 18 has been asked, 18, 24, and 36 have been asked. But we know 
we know that we have patients who will be just fine with six months, patients who will be just fine with nine months and 12 months. And you and I both know what a tremendous difference it makes for patients to come off of hormone therapy at a time that they have a chance of recovering their testosterone. Because you know that the longer they stay on it and the older they may get, it'll be harder and harder to recover that testosterone. Sure. And if the and if there's a PSA rise, just get back on it. In some ways, that's very rational. But even then, I, I suspect that there's a lot more to the story than just the PSA. I think that the PSA can rise, but the patients may never experience any concerning symptoms. Oh, that's it. You're opening up a can of worms here, Nima. In other words, how do we interpret this? PSA recurrence does not equate, doesn't have to equate to mortality necessarily. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, yeah, we know that doesn't. And I think that you know, we, we, this is where being a holistic doctor in your position really helps reframe the conversation about, yes, I can bring your PSA down. The best way to do it is to castrate you. If you're lucky and you're at a state where you're sensitive to hormone therapy, that will take care of it. The big question is to what end? And, and what are we trying to accomplish? Are we concerned that you're going to die of a PSA rise? I have yet to find someone who has died of a PSA rise. I have people who have metastatic disease. They also don't necessarily die of all of their metastatic disease. When you're 85 and your PSA rises after radiotherapy, what is the rush to treat someone right away outside of the mind of both the doctor and the patient? The conversation into what you're describing, risk of mortality from a PSA rise. I think that most people know that it doesn't, but sometimes it's hard to not do something about something, you know? As doctor. While I understand yeah. numbers for a lot of people, particularly engineer patients that I have numbers tell a story and they're very honed in on that number Absolutely. for better or worse, right? I always pride myself in saying that I treat people, not numbers, and we'll see how the numbers respond, but I rather I treat people. Yeah, as we all should aspire to do so, but Thanks for watching. Catch the full episode on the Dr. Geo Prostate Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss our next insight. We're honored to be part of your prostate health journey.